Good morning and welcome back to White Mountains Today here at White Mountain TV 16. And joining us in the studio is Rick Wilcox and Tom Pollard. And uh, they are going to be speaking this Friday at the Theater in the Wood in Intervale about Everest. And Everest 1991 to 2019. And uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Glad Good you could be here. be here. I understand that, uh, that uh, Mark is off traveling somewhere. Gallivanting. Um, Mark's in it. And uh, so let's talk about this program that is coming up. Well, actually, well, yeah, let's do a quick overview of what this program is. Then we're going to talk about some of your experiences and really kind of talk about why this is so fascinating. We've been talking for the last half hour, talking about why the difference between 1991 and 2019 is so fascinating with Mount Everest. Yeah, it, it's an, it is an interesting thing. A lot has changed on Mount Everest since Rick first summited in 1991. But the one thing that hasn't changed and will never change is that, first, it's the highest mountain in the world, and people will always want to go there. But, but primarily, because it's the highest mountain in the world, the spirit of adventure, the desire to get to the summit is still pure and vibrant. In fact, it's probably greater than it's ever been because it's more accessible. And what Rick and Mark and I endeavor to do in this presentation is talk about those changes that have, have really kind of damaged Everest in terms of at least how people look at it, but, but keeping to the point that the pure nature of adventure is what drives people there. And that's never changed since yeah. going back into the 1920s. And it's amazing. Rick, you said you, you summited in 1991, and you were what number? You were the 400th person? Uh, you were 260th person to climb Everest and 360th ascent. And now uh, that number... Meaning that and, you know some people had done it more than once. Right. Sherpas, just Sherpas. But no. now, I mean, that's half the, twice that number summited this year. It's over 5,000 now. Yeah. Individual summiters, I believe. Many of those are multiple ascents, but yeah, now hundreds of people can, can get up every year. So Rick, what, what sparked you to do it in, in 1991? Well, I first went to the Himalayas in 1985 to climb Choyu Yu, and uh, another peak that uh, Gazumpa Khan won actually turned out to be quite a, a great climb, but uh, I knew as a kid that I wanted to go to the Himalayas. And so after uh, five, four other Himalayan expeditions on Makalu, the fifth highest, Choyu, the sixth highest peak in the world. Um, I sort of hoped that somebody from out west would, would uh, call me up and say, I got an all-expense trip paid to Everest <laughs> or something, but they never called me. The Westerners were... So I put together uh, the New England 1991 American Everest expedition, and uh, we got together with our climbing buddies, um, and we had a great trip. We went in the spring, which is the normal season in May. We summited on May 15th, four of us out of eight. It was great. And um, we were very alone on the mountain. Uh, by the time we got ready to summit, the other th well, there were other four other groups there. Three of them had gone home. And the other one was kind of, Ed Vistas had a client he was kind of working with. And basically, we never stood in line ever. We never had a situation where there was a, a log jam or whatever you want yeah. to call those people up on the mountain. Mm. Uh, the summit day, which we had to be very patient to eventually get, uh, was absolutely perfect. You could have lit a match on the summit. We have some good shots of the summit ridge with nobody on it. Yeah. Uh, in contrast to that famous shot that came out uh, this year with the 200 people within a quarter yeah. of a mile or whatever the last little bit of the summit distance is there. Um, so we're very, very blessed. We... Uh, in contrast to Tom, who um, is very good with computers and very good with technology, I didn't have any of those skills anyway, so it didn't matter. But we had no weather forecasting, no internet, no connection with the outside world at all. Not one phone call home in four months. So uh, you really felt like you were really out there kind of alone. No helicopter rescues, no nothing. Yeah. I mean, if you screwed up, that was it. So. And then, Tom, you went uh, for the first time. Um, you attempted or we're going to attempt in 1999, and that, of course, turned into a, a, a totally different experience. Absolutely. In 99, I was invited to go film for PBS and the BBC to film a documentary wherein we were trying to discover the bodies of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin. 
who disappeared high upon the mountain in 1924. So 75 years later, what we really wanted to do was go and discover the bodies, hopefully find the camera we know that they were carrying. And if we could develop the film in that camera, we might be able to determine if possibly they were the first to right. summit Mount Everest, not Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Now in 1999 on the north, it was still a lot more like Rick's experience in 91. So I was just at the beginning of that guiding element, and, but, but there was still a, an empty Wild West kind of feeling on the mountain. We were out there alone. I did get one telephone call home in the middle of that expedition on a satellite phone, and I was allowed to talk until the battery died. And I had a 15-month-old son at home, so it was really hard, and he had just fallen down the stairs and cut his chin open and had like eight stitches on his chin. <laughs> Classic uh, of my older son to have that happen. But, but then, in, so I did not have an opportunity to summit. I went up to 27,200 feet, got a taste of altitude, and... I was, like Rick, physiologically predisposed to be really good at altitude. Yeah. It felt great. Uh, we discovered the body of George Mallory. It made world news, cover of the New York Times, and Newsweek, Time Magazine, books, you name it. So suddenly I was kind of on the map, and that gave me the opportunity to go back another three times since then, including 2019 with Mark, and be paid to do it. Yeah. That's my job. I'm a, I'm a documentary filmmaker, so I actually get to make money on these trips. So saying no is a real heartbreaker for me. It's, this is, these are my paydays, so to speak, but it's a place I love. Rick certainly understands that draw. The minute you set your eyes on Everest, it, it, you become a zombie. Yeah. You, go, ha, ha, you just want to get closer to it. It draws well, you in. Just, just the Himalayas in general, and they're oh, spectacular. Yeah. Um, I've been there 38 times now. Wow. To the Himalayas. I haven't been to Walmart 38 times. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah, yeah. right. Either so, have I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. And, and that's it. We were talking about it before, is that there are numerous mountains around the world, fabulous mountains to climb for a mountaineer, much more challenging mountains, you say, because of the roots and stuff like that. But Everest is Everest. That's right. It is. And... and uh, that's what the attraction is. And, of course, over the years, uh, after my uh, expedition, which was successful, nobody got hurt. You know, we got half the team to the top. Boy, that's really great. We want to thank Mark Chauvin. He didn't quite sum it, but he sure hauled loads and put in ropes and did all the work that it took to help get everybody up there. Uh, but then the, the 96 uh, tragedy, if you want to call it, or whatever it was with the, the, the dueling guided parties yeah. of... Uh, uh, Rob Hall and um, Scott Fisher uh, losing, well, I don't know, 14 people or something like that in two days uh, by breaking the rules of climbing up there, not turning back when it was appropriate to turn back. If you are not on the summit by noon or 1 o'clock, you got to get out of there. Right. Those afternoon storms come in every day. That was not a rogue storm, as they called it. Um, that book, Into Thin Air, that um, event in 96, just the numbers of permit requests skyrocketed right after that, and numerous other guide companies got involved. The permit fee went from less than probably about four or five hundred dollars a person when I went. I think we paid five grand for eight of us, twelve thousand bucks a piece. Wow, just to get on the mountain today, more <laughs> than my entire expedition cost per person when we went in 91, and yeah. that was for everything. Of course, we didn't have any Sherpas and things. The po I mean, we had minimal staff, but uh, I'd been on some expeditions with Polish climbers that really taught me how to go cheap, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, bare bones. But, you know, that's what real climbers do. You know, they live in their vans, and they, you know. Right, right. And uh, Tommy and I make our living uh, doing numerous, you know, he's a filmer, and I have done lecturing and, and run a gear shop store, you know, the IME store, and run uh still guiding uh tourists around the himalayas uh, the trips are getting a little more modest now in my older years <laughs> here but uh, we're still going we have a trip going in april so it's, unbe up, it's up unbelievable to the area. yeah mm -hmm. and i you know I, I won't get into you know tread these waters too deep but the fact now that so many people attempted and over 700 summited this year which means that there were even more who were going to do it 
And there is that photo of the line, which is, you know, in my humble opinion, disgusting. Um, what do you feel about that, about all these people risking a lot to do this? Well, it's a different type of person than Mark and Tom and myself. These are people that are professional adventurers. They are wealthy overachievers. They have done other things uh, similar uh, when a wealthy adventurer is in base camp and somebody brings them a pair of crampons and explains what they're used for, shows them how to tie onto the rope. It blows my mind. Yeah. It was my 25th expedition. As a climber, I felt that I'd earned the right to go to Everest. Yeah. When we applied in 90, uh, actually in, in 1986 for the permit, the next available one was six years away. And we had to get endorsed by the American Alpine Club. We had to prove we could pay for it. Each climber was scrutinized for permission to climb the mountain in, in 91. Now you write the check for $12,000. You give it to the Nepalese government. Multiply that times how many people are there. Right. And all that money goes into politicians' pockets. It doesn't go into the parking lots at the base of Everest, let me tell you. Uh, it's, it's huge money for the Nepalese government. And, and you're in. There is no requirement except writing the check. Now, let's say Tom and Mark and I got together and said, well, let's go back again and do something. Well, we would have to first take into consideration that the two normal routes, the one in the north and the one in the south, the Hillary route and the Mallory route, are going to be covered in people during the season. So how would we climb the peak, avoiding the people, mm -hmm and getting to the top in a safe manner where we're dealing with only the dangers of the mountain and not necessarily the human factor, which is way more dangerous. People following you, uh, I mean, just trying to rescue people that need to be rescued. Yeah. I mean, it just would, it just the, the potential for disaster is just so high. And people are dying in line, you know. Um, so we might choose a different route, the West Ridge, the North Face. You know, we may choose to go in a different time, which Mark did yeah. after the season. But you're mountaineers. So we, we want to climb the mountain. We don't want to climb over people. Yeah. And, you know, those lines are horrendous because you can't pass. And, I mean, and, and climbers need to go at their own pace. So uh, it would be very challenging. It adds a whole new dimension to climbing the highest peak in the world for young climbers. Absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. can't be like, oh, yeah, my friend's up there. i got to cut in line. And, and I just I find it so fascinating. You know, it's one of those things Hans and I were talking about it earlier that, you know, we knew of Everest as kids, and it was always that, you know, elusive thing. Um, my true introduction to kind of getting an understanding of it was from your expedition in 1991. You know, Bob Grant, you know, was there at the base camp with you. I learned a lot from him about that. I went to one of your presentations. Um, and then in reading Into Thin Air, you know, really kind of getting that. And then reading Into Thin Air and going, wow, Rick Wilcox did this, and I know Rick and everything else. So... It's always been a very fascinating thing for me. And then meeting Tom and talking to all the things that, you know, that Tom has done, to me, that's the adventure of it. Um, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I wish I could be there on, on Friday. And I hope that you do this a lot because I think this is something that, and knowing that you're talking about three people who live in our town. And, and as you said, Mount Washington Valley is base camp. It's my base camp. Um, it's and the fact that, that, you, ha that no. you have these people, you know, our neighbors, makes it even interesting. I remember your son, when you summited, mm -hmm. he posted on Facebook. He was like, my dad's on the summit. He was like, oh, my God. You know, and, and my son came up and said, Tom's on the summit. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Even now I'm kind of feeling just yeah. because, you know, this is something, these are people I know. Um, so let's just talk again. We're running out of time, unfortunately. We could be here for hours. Um, talk about the program on Friday. Well, we are going to put this program together. Rick is going to come out and start it. We'll call him the father of, of local Mount Everesters. I won't say grandfather because we, have prote we were protégés of guys way older than us who are no longer with us. But, but Rick is going to come out and start and give about a 15-minute 
presentation about his experience there, and then it will be followed by me, and I'll give a 15 minute or so about my experiences on the mountain. And then that will lead in naturally to Mark and how Mark and I overlapped in our 2019 expedition, which we took part in together on the north side. And that will be followed by a question and answer uh, opportunities for people to ask those questions because there are a lot of questions. We all see things differently. The, the media has been very, very harsh on people who climb Everest. And, and I'm going to jump in there a little bit and I tell you, this is one thing that Mark's going to say. People are going to go, those lines on Everest, it's, it's disgusting. And, and, and I get it. I, I really do understand. But Mark and I and the rest of our team, we waited back. We let that team go forward. And I remember vividly, Mark would binoculars looking up and seeing a, a line of people going up toward the summit and they're like what do you think about that and he goes you know what that's inspiring that people would put themselves out there because they desire so badly to be at the highest part of this world to be able to put themselves into that danger because they desire it so much so so it, it's kind of the flip side of it yeah. no we didn't want to be there we waited we took we coin tossed it to maybe lose our opportunity but those are the things we're going to talk about. The mountain has indeed changed and in how the world views it so much. But, um, but the pure spirit of adventure is alive. And the cool thing is, hopefully we sell that place out, raise a lot of money for the mountain rescue service, keep rescuing people who go out and make boneheaded or absolute, like, understandable mistakes yeah. in the mountains. We want to keep those people safe. This is the Mount Washington Valley. We've got a an amazing community of climbers and hikers and and this is our way to kind of give back and say thank you for not only the geography but for the the community that supports people like us doing what we do well i mean it just sounds like an unbelievable program and you know i've been fortunate enough to be able to chat with you guys over the years and get little little snippets of it um yeah. and so being at that program uh i uh, encourage people obviously there are tickets available I would say don't wait till Friday night to wait. buy your ticket. It will sell uh, out. It will sell yeah. out. It, you know, and Theater in the Wood is such a great place. Uh, it'll be, you know, it has a lot of room, but it's also very intimate. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be a great place to be able to, uh, to sit back and, and enjoy this program. So. Yeah, so you would want to go to the best place, I think, to send people if they want to buy tickets is go to Facebook and, and type in the search bar Everest 91 219, 2 T O 19, and it should come up. Ragged yeah. is selling them online, and then we've set up an event bright, bright page. The tickets are 20 bucks for, for general admission. We also have like VIP tickets, so, so a few hundred dollar tickets, and for the persons or people or persons who want to buy those tickets, they get to hang out with us backstage, and we're going to give this this really cool poster that Rick, Mark, and I will all sign. It's, it's our promotional poster, but we're going to have food and, and nice. a little elbow rubbing. There's the poster. I yeah, see it online. Great poster. And we'll sign that. And, um, and, and so it, we have a lot going on. There's going to be uh, an event beforehand at Ragged Mountain, uh, a reception. Tyler's working on free libations and food, so I don't think you need to bring anything other than your body and, and your friends and, and get there. This is really a one-of-a-kind event. This does not happen that often. I'd like to go on tour with these guys, <laughs> but this could be it, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so make sure you show up, get there, and it, it will be unforgettable. Yeah, and I just want to throw out, you, just, you had said something about um, you know, Mark looking up at all those people and yeah. saying how he was inspired. And just that sentence that you said really kind of makes me look at that perspective. As I said, I think it's terrible. That line is terrible. And, and I think what's so terrible is that these people want to do it. And, you know, if that's the only way you can do it, that's frustrating, where you mm -hmm. had a kind of a pure adventure. And I feel bad because, you know, everybody wants to do it and for them not to be able to because there's a line and mm -hmm. everything else and, and things happening, uh, that's, that's too bad. Um, and is, I love yeah. the idea of you going back and creating another, you know, you know, finding another way up and, and being able to adventure. I mean, I could, you know, I would obviously have to take the very standard route, you know, maybe you could drive me up there. Um, to base camp. To, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that was, that's a really neat perspective in mm -hmm. saying that, you know, don't take, you know, like you say, the newspaper and the media, don't, don't besmirch these people who want to do it. 
because they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's the it's the whole it's the bigger picture is where right. you, where right. there might be some issues. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. But I, I think it's just going to be an amazing program. So this Friday, yep. um, starting at six p.m. I think it yeah, was. Yeah, the event starts, yeah. I believe, at 6 p.m. 6 um, to 9, yeah. 6 to 9, and maybe 6.30, but show up early. And, and when you do the search on Facebook, it will tell you when the reception yep. starts. Yeah. And uh, come to the reception, hang out. There'll be a lot of people, a lot of laughter and good times. And uh, the, the only difficulty I see with this event, like, and it's Rick, Mark, and I all have a real gift for not only, we could hold an audience for two hours alone, but to try to squeeze us yeah, in gonna be, is going to be a challenge. this big hook, you know? Yeah. A hook. So I think it's going to culminate in a three-man wrestling match, and there's a big, gigantic vat of jello. Well, there we, we go. There. In. I don't know. That would be the payoff. That's where the VIP tickets come in. Yeah. Yeah. They get to witness that firsthand. Absolutely. So uh, it is going to be the challenge to get it all in, and uh, that's why I endeavor to get this thing filmed and share it. But, yeah. but yeah. this guy, man, he got it all started. He inspired a lot of people. It's an Absolutely. honor just to be right next to him. Well, we went fight. together. What? What year did we go? In '96, together? Rick and I went yeah. to Gashabram too in yeah. Pakistan, yeah. and we. But before that, uh, we went to. Um, we did that Annapurna thing up into. Oh gosh, right. Uh, yeah, when I got cholera. <laughs> in Annapurna. Whatever. Right? In 1992 yeah. or three. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Jeez, I don't like climbing onto the roof of my garage. You don't want yet. cholera. So, no, I don't explain what happens to you. Yeah, either. I don't, I don't <laughs> think I, I don't think I want that. Well, it, it definitely is going to be a great program. Yeah. Um, so thanks so much, Rick and Tom Thank and um, Mark and Abstentia for coming by today. And uh, we'll see you on Friday at Theater in the Wood. Back here in a minute on White Mountains Today.